Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Memorial Art Gallery and the evening's uh, program, Archie Rands the 613, From Conception to Creation. Archie is uh, in Detroit. Samantha Baskind, our scholar and who will be in conversation with Archie, is in Cleveland. I'm in Rochester, New York, and where the exhibition is at the Memorial Art Gallery. Let me just take a, a minute or so to introduce you now and Samantha. And, uh, and, and then after that, you two uh, should get going on uh, a conversation that I've been waiting uh, to hear and watch myself. Um, so about Archie Rand, Archie uh, uh, is an artist who deals with Jewish subject matter. And, and those artists uh, like Archie, who similarly deal with Jewish subject matter, consider him a pioneer of Jewish iconography. After years of research and scholarship on religious iconography, Rand's Archie, uh, now that I know him personally, uh, work contemplates heady questions regarding the limits and allowances of the invention of iconography available in Hebrew culture, as well as the notion and the fiction of symbols. Archie's work as a painter, muralist, and graphic artist is held in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, Art Institute of Chicago, the Brooklyn Museum, Baltimore Museum of Art, Smithsonian Institution, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Victorian Albert Museum, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, Tel Aviv Museum of Art, Carnegie Museum of Art, Dallas Museum of Art, and the New York Public Library. His works are included in the university and library collections of Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Brown, and Johns Hopkins, among many others. There have been over 100 solo exhibitions of his art. He has created collaborative projects with many poets, among whom are Robert Creeley, John Ashbery, Kenneth Koch, Clark Coolidge, David Plant, John Yao, Bill Berkson, Marilyn Despiolis, David Lehman, Bob Holman, Ann Waldman, Lewis Warsh, and David Shapiro. He was awarded among numerous, numerous honors, the Achievement Medal for Contributions to the Visual Arts by the National Foundation for Jewish Culture, and is a recipient of a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, formerly chair of the Department of Visual Arts at Columbia University. He is currently the Presidential Professor of Art at Brooklyn College in the City University of New York. His home and studio are located in Brooklyn, New York. Our other guest this evening, Samantha Baskind, is professor of art history at Cleveland State University and the author of five books, most recently The Warsaw Ghetto in American Art and Culture. And she is co-editor of the Jewish graphic novel, Critical Approaches, the foundational volume in the field. She has contributed more than 100 articles and reviews on art, identity, and religion to museum catalogs, academic journals, edited volumes, encyclopedias, and the mainstream press. She served as editor for US Art for the 22 volume revised edition of the Encyclopedia Judaica and is currently series editor, editor for Dimyonot, Jews and the Cultural Imagination, published by Penn State University Press. The leading scholar on Archie Rand's art, Dr. Baskin curated the highly acclaimed traveling exhibition, Archie Rand, 60 Paintings from the Bible. And it is my pleasure to welcome them both here to us in this Zoom space. Uh, and now Samantha, Archie, I invite you to embark on your conversation about the 613 from conception to creation. Um, I will encourage all of our guests to uh, click the Q&A button on the bottom of their screen when they have questions. I know many of you do, and I look forward to hearing them. We've been uh, having many spirited conversations and debates about your uh, body of work, the 613, Archie, uh, here at the MAG. I just had a fantastic one on Father's Day while uh, going to vote. Um, early in the, uh, 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 the election that took place Tuesday. 
um, where I ran into a friend from the MAG and we had a wonderful and spirited conversation about your work. Um, it's generated so much interest and I hope we get to uh, answer and, 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 and um, consider uh, some of the thoughts and, and questions that folks have been uh, coming up with here in Rochester. So with all that, thank you. And now I'm going to turn my video off and leave it to both of you. Thank you for your kind words, Jonathan. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to be with all of you tonight and of course with Archie Rand. This exhibition is quite phenomenal. If you haven't seen it, I hope I can. you can if you're in the area. Because most people think about the Torah and rabbinic writings as severe and often violent and always very inside baseball in their minutia. But to Archie, there's humor in all the thou shall nots. His series of 613 canvases, which is on exhibition right now, is one per commandment in Jewish scripture. Sorry, and it treats, I didn't catch that. And it treats biblical admonitions with a technicolor palette and visual allusions to comic books and pulp fiction and other unexpected sources. And the series, which took six years to complete and it covers 1700 square feet of wall space, looks looks back to biblical and serial painters like Masaccio and the Bayeux Tapestry, while also borrowing from much more familiar and recent material. And that speaks to younger viewers, I think. And as you will see, Archie's biblical art does not represent worship, but rather more of an exuberant wise guy meditation on the sacred writ. And Archie, is so articulate about this. I think a good place to start for our audience tonight, Archie, is a discussion of your thought process when conceptualizing this extraordinary series. Artistically and intellectually, how did you arrive at a place where you would marry text and image in 613 20 by 16 inch canvases? Because I think many people would be surprised to learn how intellectually rigorous, demanding, and complicated this project is. Well, uh, uh, text and image is something that goes back to my initial yearnings to be an artist. And that goes back to when I was a child, basically. Um, I was inspired by people like N.C. Wyeth, for instance. And uh, when I was a kid, I would, as many children do, I would read up until the next illustration. And uh, Wyatt's work in particular, or Maxfield Parrish, or Randolph Caldecott, um, I, I wanted to be that person when I grew up. I wanted to be the person that did that. So the notion of, of text or narrative with the visual was always something that was internalized. When I was a teenager, I was a friend of, or befriended by, an older group of poets um, who hung around the St. Mark's Poetry Workshop, uh, Paul Blackburn, Gilbert Sorrentino. And Gilbert Sorrentino in particular was, uh, he would never admit, as far as I know, to being influenced by the Olipo movement coming out of Paris, um, the only American constituent of that was Harry Matthews. But uh, Gil worked that way, Gil would write a series of poems that were loosely armatured by an almost irrelevant number. Uh, that is the letters of the alphabet or, uh, or some other imported numerical uh, construct. And I found that as a young painter to be a very interesting way to turn out more than one painting at a time, which is always stressful. You're working on a painting and you labor over it and then you finish the painting. Well, if I worked on 26 or 50 or 15 or 18 or 100 paintings at a time, I could consider them a mural and a mural that would then be broken into pieces, but in fact, talked to each other very much the way a series of poems would. And uh, I was not, uh, I was not shy to put the words into the paintings, which is something I did at a very early age, because I thought that my painting skills, and this is a confession, were not adequate to convey 
the point that I wanted to make, the emotional impact that I wanted to make. Uh, I didn't think that my painting skills were equivalent to that of the people I admired, be it N.C. Wyeth or be it Franz Klein. Um, so after uh, a very short period of time being involved with Clement Greenberg and the Colorfield painters, I must have been about 17 at the time, I guess, and having this background with the poets, I broke off into putting actual words into the, what later became called the letter paintings. I don't know if I'm adequately answering your question, but that's the background as to how the uh, text and the image became simultaneously important. As I got older, I thought to myself, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, there's something wrong with a painter who can't paint in just right words. So at the end of a letter painting series, uh, there we go, that's the beginning of it, um, where I start to put images in and you'll see on the bottom that uh, I have one of the early drawings for the letter paintings, which is the, the, uh, the vocal group, the Cadillacs. And I wanted each letter to be, to resonate as an individual visual image. And by the end of the series, the pictures look almost similar to the beginning of the series. So let's, yeah. let's look at the letter paintings for a, a moment. Okay. In Thank this you. early period when you're really working, not very, you know, not narratively, not with images that we recognize that we can see with our eyes and say, oh, this is a face, this is an apple, this is a gangster. So these are the, this is an, an excellent installation of the letter paintings. Yes, that was an exit art, I believe in 1991 in New York, the fabulous exit art. And uh, by the end of 71, uh, I started to think, well, you know, a painter who's not painting images, that's very odd. So I went back into either figuration or abstraction, uh, eventually zeroing in on abstraction. But that white painting that you showed, self-portrait, if I could bring that back again, that's the last of the letter paintings where I'm taking, or one of the last of them, where I'm writing little diaristic entries when I decide that they're not consonant with the entire lyric or poetry of the painting. I actually erase them. So what's left is, is that text, but the images are collaged on. I still hadn't had the, uh, the, the, confidence or authority to paint them directly. In fact, Larry Poons had said to me, hey man, how come you're just not painting them? You know, So uh, very soon after that, uh, I started, to, uh, I started to, to paint them directly on the canvas, getting my confidence up. But before that, if you, is, is the B'nai Yosef slide coming up soon or? Sure as I can bring it up, there you go. Uh, that's not it. No, not that we were gonna work our way up to it. So, oh, okay. Why don't yeah. you explain <laughs> to everyone about the B'nai Yosef Commission, and then we'll get we'll get to the other material. Okay. So I have Dura Europus for you to talk about too. Yes. Um, so should I go into B'nai Yosef? Sure. Yes. Go into B'nai Yosef. Okay. Um, in 1974, my daughter Elena was going to the yeshiva of Flatbush, which at that time was one of the best schools in the country. It was a, uh, a Hebrew English day school. And uh, the tuition was extremely high, even by the standards of those days. And uh, I could not afford it. I was your typical starving artist. I was holding down four part-time jobs with a house, a studio, and, uh, and a kid and one on the way. And uh, the director, a man named David Schwartz, may his memory be blessed, <laughs> whom I consider the inventor of modern Jewish art, he was the administrator. And he said, uh, I have a friend building a synagogue. And uh, it's this typical story, you know, the man doesn't like the congregation he's with, he decides to build his own synagogue. And he was building it basically for him and his family. It was sort of like the Brancacci Chapel, except it was enormous. He bought out an entire, you know, block gas station, knocked it down and built this very big synagogue. And uh, they were at a dinner one night and I had some of my, my murals up in the yeshiva of Flatbush, which is what I was doing to help pay for the cost of tuition. And uh, he said to Dave Schwartz, um, is this guy any good, this painter? And Dave said, oh, this guy's a genius. He's wonderful. Um, you should have him paint murals in your synagogue. And the owner or the builder of the synagogue said, I was just gonna put up wood paneling. He said, don't be stupid. If you don't like the paintings, you can put the wood, wood paneling on top of it, hire this guy. So uh, 
I got this commission to do, I think it's about, I don't know, 12, 18,000 square feet. I don't know how big the place is of murals in a Orthodox synagogue. Uh, the congregation is mainly from Syria. And after I put up the, the imperative menorah and Magin David, I realized I had 36 panels to go that the rabbis were going to question me intently on, and there was no such thing as Jewish iconography. And I basically had to invent it, which surprised me. I thought that I would find precedent. And the only precedent that I could find was Dury Europus, which is the uh, second century synagogue uh, found in at, near Damascus in Dury Europus, which is a Talmud era synagogue uh, with everything you can possibly think of in it. Direct figurative narration, even the hand of God is, is portrayed in this. And I thought, wow, I certainly have permission to paint the walls of a synagogue, regardless of the fact that it hasn't existed in 2000 years. But uh, I'm certainly not going to antagonize the congregation by putting figuration on it because that would really send them over the top. So what I had to do was I had to find images that represented the narrative nuggets from larger commentaries. That is, if somebody had said to me, you know, oh, heaven is wonderful, I'd say, well, that's great, but I can't paint it. But if they said God sits on a throne, I said, okay, I have a noun, I have a throne. So I went to the uh, Masif de Gavoa, the Lakewood Yeshiva, and I sat and I studied with these basically 18 year olds who were fabulous. I mean, that kind of you know energy can't be found anywhere else. And I had this whole squad of kids looking for me. I was about 24 at the time. And I said, I want you to go through everything you can possibly go through, all these obscure texts and find whatever commentary you can. And, uh, and I'll be able to use that as imagery. Anyway, so, I'm, hold on, I'm gonna interrupt you. Sure. We, we, I wanna get to, we gotta get to the 613. So let's connect B'nai Yosef. Got it. To the 613 how you, you, know, you found a Jewish iconography, you decided you wanted to make Jewish art through this commission especially, and then your interest in how you know, letters and words and images connect on this upper balcony area on the top right of this image of B'nai Yosef. Yeah, that, that uh, painting was initially um, um, titled in, in honor of my friend Gilbert Sorrentino. And what it is, is after the letter paintings, I started to take still collaging elements. It looks to me like a couple of hundred small paintings and I collage them directly onto canvas. And this was about 1972. And when the commission came up, I realized that in the abstract section upstairs, which is the women's section where I'm not supposed to do anything that, that smacks of learning, <laughs> Uh, but I still had to have it validated by the rabbis as being absolutely kosher. I could explain everything. So I had a wall of miracles for Passover. And uh, I decided that this would be attached to the wall in B'nai Yosef and have its narrative transferred from being an abstract concept to a religious concept. But the notion of what I called in the letter paintings and what I call in these paintings here, simultaneous sequence. That is, the images all appear simultaneously, but they can be, they can be read narratively or sequentially uh, at the same time. So there's a, there's a bifurcation of how the information is, is uh, digested by the viewer. And I sort of like that. And I thought of it at the time as being Talmudic. At the time, I thought to myself, well, you know, you have 11 rabbis chiming in on one question. All of them disagree with each other, and there is no indication as to who's correct. You just have to sit and think about it and run it over in your mind. And that's what that painting represented to me. And the notion of putting things together like that um, became a dominant feature of my work to come. That is just everything breaking loose at the same time. Ah. In 1985, um, after I came back from doing murals in Jerusalem, uh, I did murals on the seven days of creation. And I decided that there was something about 
life <laughs> uh, from a non-philosopher that is both menial and, and, and inconsequential on one sense and means everything on the other. So I copied a cartoon called uh, Jimmy Swinnerton, uh, where basically his mother gives him money to go to the grocery store and buy something and he kind of messes up, uh, but he's cute. And I just copied the entire cartoon and on the same canvas below it, I wrote, I, I drew and painted the creation with all of its midrashic weight uh, on the bottom. And I sort of equated the two. That is, you know, life is everything from the Jimmy Swinnerton cartoon to the most searing rabbinical questions or theological questions or existential questions that one can possibly have about life. And I started to introduce the notion of the cartoon there because I figured what could be more accessible and, and non-threatening than the cartoon. And then you started to combine cartoons <laughs> comics with biblical work. So you're bringing them together now. They're not separate anymore in this series, 60 Pages from the Bible. Right. What happened then was I still felt the, the, the pain of being treated very hostily by my younger colleagues uh, from the years 1975 onward, after I had taken on the commission to do B'nai Yosef. The notion of doing um, murals that were not only figurative among the abstract painters with whom I was friends, but worse, religious, really set people off. I mean, you're talking about an era where Clem Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg, well, Rosenberg less, to a lesser degree, but Greenberg specifically uh, was making pictures where narrative and therefore the notion of the spiritual content of narrative could be religion, should evaporate. And it bothered me and it also interested me that people were so angry at religious painting. I must say that the people who supported my work were the older painters, uh, Helen Frankenthaler, Jules Olitsky, and most notably Philip Guston. So around 1976, 77, these people uh, became very supportive. And that was of course, extremely encouraging. So the idea of mixing text with the Bible in a less reverent way, because what happened in 1992 with this particular series is for the first time after 20 years of being rabbinically obedient, that is not wanting the rabbis to be able to question anything I was doing, I decided that the rabbis didn't really have purchase on any knowledge of what the visual should represent. That was the artist's job. And for me to take uh, instruction from the rabbis and criticism, as much as I could could or not respect them, uh, was an irrelevant piece of direction. Uh, the rabbis don't know any more about this than they know about anything else that's not kosher. So I thought that the visual had to take the primary platform in this work. So for the first time, I decided that the work would be primarily visual and secondarily uh, accessible to those people. 60 paintings from the Bible is the first time I did that. So I took images uh, mostly from an engraver named Marianne, whose daughter is probably more well known than he is, uh, Sibylla Marianne, who did these wonderful flora paintings, uh, drawings basically. And uh, he did a whole series on the Bible. And uh, I decided to copy the ones that had reference to the Hebrew Bible and the Apocrypha and uh, paint them in a way that did not show a reverence for the, for the way those images were made, but kind of jacked them up into more contemporary viewership so that the, it would be apparent to the viewer that, uh, that these were looking at these kinds of images in another way. <clears throat> and then I took the text. Well, I'm going to interrupt there. again, Archie. Hold yeah, on. sure. I can go on forever. Go ahead. I know you can. It's one of your best qualities, but we need to get to the 613. So this, this series is your transition of yes. being less reverent and painting in a large group. So we have 60 paintings and then talk about amping it up 
we get to the 613 where we have 613 paintings and even more irreverence. So right. now that we've hit the 613, I have this sort of panorama so we can get a sense of how beautiful it looks in the gallery, of course. And then I thought we would look at a few individually. Now, I want you to explain to our audience how it's very important these aren't really separate paintings. They're part of a larger project that all works cohesively. But at the same time, give a sense of the iconography and the coloration that you use and how you've adapted kinds of different images and so forth. So if you could talk yes, about the process of iconography in these individual works, that would be great. I've, uh, I've, I've lost your, your audio, so I didn't get the question. Could you repeat that, please? Um, that I'm, ch I'm choosing a few paintings right. just to look at individually, right? They're part of the larger project, but what, where does this iconography come from? Why did you choose this palette? Okay, um, the iconography comes from, I was questioning if I was invading the notion of the visual, which is something that Jews have been either self-exiled from or externally exiled from utilizing, I had to find some place where I felt comfortable um, taking or assimilating a, a, an, an image or a style that I thought of as being acceptable to Jewish culture. And uh, it occurred to me that the comic book industry, most notably the studio of Will Eisner that produced not only EC Comics, but Mad Magazine, uh, that, that was Will Eisner's legacy. Will is a, was a genius in his own right. But people like Will Elder and Stan Lee and Jules Pfeiffer, they all worked for Will Eisner. And Mad Magazine had a tremendous effect on me, as did EC Comics. And I thought, well, since everyone who worked on those things, not everyone, but almost everyone was Jewish, um, that, that's a sort of Jewish comic book language that I can adopt. And I didn't adopt the Superman Batman style, which is more famous, because there was more vulgarity in the Will Eisner Mad Magazine EC comic style. And I wanted to embrace the vulgarity of how Jews are perceived. Uh, it's something that I learned from Will Eisner, it's something that I learned from Philip Guston. Um, that is, stranger, um, and you're going to be ridiculed for your habits and your behavior, uh, you may as well own up to it. And what I loved about EC and Mad Magazine was the absolute outrageousness of the, of the visual information. It was it was beyond the pale to the point where Congress had to actually step in and ask them to uh, voluntarily tone it down. And Mad Magazine was simply hysterical. Now, the point of the 613 is there's something very Borscht Belt about it. Um, if, you're, if you're a lightly denominational person of any religion, you have 10 commandments. If you're an observant Jewish person, you have 613, probably a little bit more commandments. And the pressure of that is, is uh, it's untenable. That is one cannot possibly function thinking subscribe to 613 commandments. So the, the fact is that this, the, the pressure of this, of this subscription to, to these millions of laws, because each of these laws has subdivisions that have been argued in, in rabbinical commentary, uh, makes it actually funny. It, you'll pardon the word, but it's kind of gallows humor in my, in, my, uh, in, my, in, in my seeing it. There's something so intellectually pressing about being a Torah scholar or, or any, you know, I mean, you know, it's like if, if you're a lawyer, you can never know enough law. And if you're an observant Jewish person, you can never know enough. There's always more, more minutiae to, to absorb. And that to me becomes kind of funny in a way. It's also what forms a certain kind of Jewish character. So after I had done a series called the 54 chapter paintings, remember, I think of myself as a mural painter. I had done the 54 chapters of the, of the Hebrew Bible. And uh, a friend of mine said, well, you've done 50, the 54 chapters, now what are you gonna do? And I said, uh, 
I don't know, but I want to do something so enormous that that it can't be seen as a joke. I want to do something so big that the that the that the gargantuan size of it is so insolent that no matter how weird it is, there's something about just the physical weight of it that will make it take be taken seriously. Uh, now the problem again, I know you want to cut me off, but I've never said this before, so I'm going to say it now. The problem with doing it reverently, not that I have any problem with reverence, I don't, is that I learned something from looking at Picasso. Picasso's blue period is depressing people painted with depressing colors. And because of that, he has a double negative. So even though they're popular as kitsch, Picasso wasn't happy with them. I just thought that uh, it would be appropriate not to subscribe to 2000 years of, of basically the Western cultures that have kept the visual alive, but to glom onto a visual style that although in somewhat in disrepute has been already popularized by the pop artists, most notably, you know, Lichtenstein and Warhol and, and that crowd. Um, so I, uh, I, I thought I could uh, take that with impunity and just play on it. Archie and Samantha, yes. um, uh, I, I want to bring a couple of questions to your attention from our audience because, and, and regrettably, uh, we're, we're about 11 minutes away from the hour. Um, but there are some questions that I think uh, are interesting, and I'm going to share them if you don't mind. One question is, how does or will a reading of each commandment contribute to someone's appreciation of your murals in general, or your I, maybe the mural in general, the total project, or your paintings in general. Um, what can we learn from each of the commandments, in other words, of the 613 as you present them? Well, uh, they're, they're individual pieces of a larger narrative. And focusing on the individual pieces can be sort of like listening to or reading a John Ashbery poem um, or any long poem. It's sort of... Uh, one gets one gets gets a glimpse through the through the perimeter. It's a pinhole through the perimeter of the larger the, the larger construct. And some of the images are a lot more clearly attached to the narrative intent that they're that they're uh, coupled with. And some of them are a bit more uh, obscure. And some of them, no matter how hard you rack your brain, uh, won't seem to make any sense at all. And uh, what I have found is that the mind will is sort of uh, genetically coded to understand that an image has an inherent narrative. Otherwise, there'd be no meaning or no function for the image. And at some point, individual viewers, uh, the way people interpret poetry, for instance, um, I was watching a an interview with Bob Dylan where somebody, he was 25 years old and someone asked him the meaning of a lyric and he got very indignant and he said, you wouldn't ask the Beatles that question, why are you asking me? So without being you know, arrogant, but trying to be as user friendly as possible, each of the um, images has some connection, some more obvious, some are almost even illustrational, although many of them are not, um, but there is some connection and any way a viewer can get into those will add to it. It's kind of like having a 613 course dinner. You know, um, you'll like some things, not like other things. Some things will be tasty and fun to chew. Some things will not. Uh, and as such, people have their, their favorites. And since this series has been done, different people have told me what in fact their favorites are, um, which I find, you know, interesting. I suppose it's not unlike the commandments themselves. Um, yes, yes. Which, the commandments which, actually reflect on each other. Yeah. Of each commandment reflect or um, help your understanding of all the commandments or all of the got, you know, instructions of Judaism. Uh, but I, you know, I'll just say for me, uh, you're, you're, we're seeing these uh, commandments uh, as interpreted through you. It's not just the text. We're getting the text and a picture or a cartoon or an illustration or a rendering 
that changes is, is an additional element to the interpretation of the commandment. And, and, and that's the, where the, the extraordinary complexity lies. And that's really almost impossible to tackle, uh, I, I find, you know, beyond philosophizing uh, about the project. Yeah, uh, what, I, what I found reading the commandments is that sometimes you get a block of 20 or 30 commandments in a row that all have to relate to something very similar, and they're just different aspects of it. It's sort of like the negative space around one larger concept. And uh, some viewers have already seen it, but uh, there are passages in the visual 613 uh, where things will reflect back on each other as well. That is, uh, one I can think of off the top of my head is there are two contiguous panels. Uh, one is parachutes, these, uh, these you know, hemispheric uh, objects with strings attached forming a triangle. And next to it is a set of balance scales, which is an upside down hemispheric uh, object with strings attached to it pyramidally going up towards the balance of the scale. And uh, there are things like that sprinkled throughout the entire series, where there are visual puns that aren't so much funny as they are reflecting back on relationships that might happen with, with other, other pieces. One of the things I can tell you as a mural painter is sometimes you're doing something that's maybe 60 feet long and you're touching up an eyeball on some character, you know, 10 feet up in the air and you know instinctively that you've got to like, you know, lighten up the toenail on some character 45 feet down the wall that you can't even see. You just feel it instinctively. And uh, a lot of that's happening in the 613. Yeah. One of the things I love about the Rochester installation is that you can actually read them narratively rather than uh, simply being overwhelmed by the, by, the, by the size of it, which I like very much. So those questions about reading come a lot, more, uh, a, a lot more available in the Rochester installation than in previous installations or, or installations to come. It's just a, a great option. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, well, uh, I'm glad you like the installation because of I think it's fantastic um, as well. I'm biased, of course, but um, uh, <laughs> you're biased too, to some extent. But in any case, uh, one other question is, um, are the 613 commandments all equal? equal? Um, and uh, if, if not, um, do, uh, is, do you rank them maybe in importance or value or in, in what other way you might measure their significance? Yeah. I, I, I think that, uh, first of all, I don't have the rabbinic or religious authority to make such distinctions. Visually, the answer is no, because visually, as I said, I see the thing as a, as a, single, a single painting. So, um, in fact, there were times when certain images were painted in such a way that they stuck out so visually, apparently, that I either had to discard them and paint another version or just tone them down. Uh -huh. uh, there's a reason why they're all painted uh, in a kind of flat, almost um, fresco type coloration uh, and then surrounded by the, by the loud reflective gold frame is that I wanted them to sort of sink back and anneal themselves to each other as a sort of knitted fabric in a way. Uh -huh. uh, but as far as the, the specifics of the rabbinical law goes, I certainly don't have the, the experience or the authority to make any comment about that. I mean, on the obvious sense, um, yeah, we shouldn't eat maggots, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, we shouldn't kill anybody. Uh, we probably shouldn't sleep with our sisters or our brothers. And, uh, you know, those things, those things sort of, you know, make, make apparent, you know, sociological sense. But in fact, there are cultures that eat maggots. And uh, I guess it was referring to that, you know, that popular dish of the day. So, uh, you know, um, yes, go ahead. Let's talk about the installation really quickly. Um, you know, it is a fabulous installation because it is readable since it's not floor to ceiling. You know, this, I pulled up this really early slide. You look so young and handsome here in this <laughs> in your warehouse the first time this ever had a public view. And because of the way it's stacked, because you had a limited amount of space, it's not as readable. And that's in part why the installation, the current installation is so interesting. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the original intent was not for it to be readable, but to be sort of a figurative or, or, a, or a representational Jackson Pollock in a way. It always intrigued me that Pollock said that he chose to veil the imagery. And of course, I believe him. And uh, this is sort of like, 
you know, taking a Brillo pad and scrubbing it down. So I thought of it basically as a field composition, uh, if for no other reason than it's, you know, all these attached uh, squares. Uh, again, to give credit to something that uh, um, I, sh I should point out, um, a big influence on me, a person who didn't mind mixing his Judaic scholarship or lack of scholarship, as some people would say, with the fine arts uh, was Wallace Berman, whom I admire very much. And uh, Wallace Berman did a number of things where, mostly in his Verifax collages, where you see repetitive images of the same size, uh, cheek by jowl in a way. And, uh, oh, look who's there. Uh, and he, he references Warhol. And uh, it's not lost on me that Warhol was a deeply religious man, despite what anybody else wants to say about him. He never missed a mass. So there's something about the repetitiveness. Uh, Wallace Berman changes his images within the repetition. Warhol does not, uh, which is a difference between Catholic theology and Jewish theology. And I, I, I followed Berman's lead in, in having repetitive segments that, in fact, were similar but not, not identical. And so when we, we talk about this installation, it's important to note that it's the third of a public installation. You had this installation first in your warehouse, then the show was at the San Francisco Contemporary Jewish Art Museum, then it was at James Madison University in its current space. So right. what has the critical reaction been to the series? Um, well, it's been, it's been twofold. Uh, the series is more publicly available as a book, but the problem with the book is that the book features uh, individual uh, components of it, which is great, uh, and the book is extremely successful because of that, thank goodness. Uh, so the reaction to the book has been astounding. The reaction to the painting, because I'm dealing with people uh, in their immediate response when I see them, is people are... Uh, thank goodness, intrigued, some people uh, are able to dispute certain images or, or uh, discuss them with a certain amount of skepticism, and some people just absolutely love them. So uh, you know, on the book, I, I haven't had that reaction. On the book of the 613, I've had nothing but uh, uniform acceptance, uh, praise, and love, thank goodness. But uh, uh, the, the painting causes uh, a lot of, as Jonathan said initially, a lot of discussion, and all of it is healthy. Uh, none of it is, is simply, uh, is, is simply, you know, uh, off the cuff opinion. Uh, people look at it very deeply, and they 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 have questions about it. Uh, most of them, thank goodness, are uh, are are are, hap are happily directed to the picture. They're uh, they're 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 pleased and they enjoy it. Uh, children, of course, love it, and. Uh, the, the child and the adult loves it. Um, it's the person who is questioning the, the uh, consonance of the text and the image that has a, uh, a more uh, serious road to climb. And uh, those people interest me very much because we have long discussions about stuff like that. Jonathan, are there any more questions regarding that? Um, there is. Thank you for asking. And then I think we might have to wrap this up, uh, regrettably. But uh, I wonder if you can talk about your family background and its influence, if any, on your work, and further about your formal educational background, secular or religious or both. Let me think, uh, as I'm reading these, uh, as this, this question just came in. Um, and I think, um, let's skip to question number two. Pause. The question is, um, what, what, if any kind of reaction have you received from the more orthodox Chabad, uh, et cetera, Jewish communities at large um, to your work, where, as you've indicated, images of any kind can be controversial? Yes, well, I, the, the, this, this painting is not really made for the orthodox because the orthodox have 2000 years of oral Torah that compensate for the lack of the visual. That is, the literature, the rabbinical literature, makes, makes art in the way the culture has become sort of visually deformed, the Jewish culture, it makes art sort of uh, an irrelevancy. Uh, the visual was amputated at some point. So when the Orthodox 
community sees this, uh, I certainly don't have any uh, any um, feeling about their their confusion uh, when when they when they confront this. Not all of them, but uh, as I've mentioned in one of the lectures that was videoed at the Memorial Art Gallery before, you know, one one Orthodox rabbi asked me what an egg had to do with menstruation, and uh, at that point I realized that there was a real disconnect between the ability to uh, absorb and or, 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 or ingest uh, visual information uh, as, as a corollary to, yeah. to, to the textual. That is, the Orthodox community, if anything, wants straight illustration, which is what I did for 20 years uh, after B'nai Yosef uh, until, until the 60 paintings from the Bible, whereupon I realized that you know, I would have to leave the Orthodox community um, with its with its uh, assumptions, and I was very happy to 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 do that. I came to that conclusion in a way that um, I, I, there was no animosity. It was sort of like this really isn't isn't the ball game of the Orthodox community, and I, you know, I, I, I this is this is secular art. Archie uses yes. What do you say to someone, and I think this might be the last question that I have, because it'll help me and it'll help the docents uh, um, here at the MAG. What do you say to a viewer who, for example, in a specific example, because it's actual, sees the picture of a red devil in one of the commandments and um, that you depict and is, feels offended by it? Is there, how do you help that person? You know, the, 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 the devil is popular imagery at this point. And if a person wants to assume that it's religious imagery, well, there is no devil in Judaism. Um, you know, if I painted a, a painting of a statue of Buddha, um, you know, it would be equally, equally religiously ir irrelevant and visually pertinent the way I see it. So I don't think that person should be offended if they understand that all of this imagery comes from popular imagery. There's very little imagery there. I mean, I can think basically of the painting of, of, of the high priest Aaron, for instance, as being a religiously pertinent image. But most of this stuff is dragging secular imagery and sort of, you know, holding its head underwater in a way and making it, making it you know, submissive to Judaism. Uh, so I would I I would tell this viewer not to, not to be offended. It's certainly not to be it's not meant to be a a religious statement reflecting on Judaism. It's a secular statement reflecting on popular visual culture. Thank you. That's a brilliant um, last sentence, if I might say, uh, and very helpful. Um, Samantha Archie, uh, I could have continued this conversation a lot longer, but we, we are after the hour, and despite our technical challenges, I think we need to honor um, the, the challenges that Zoom presents to all of us, um, uh, meaning to say it's just difficult to stick around for too long on this exhausting medium, but energizing and engaging and exciting uh, uh, in, in the context of this conversation and in the context of your exhibition, Archie. Um, Samantha, thank you for your work on behalf of the Memorial Art Gallery. You've helped us a great deal to understand the work and, and how to talk about it. Archie, um, I was just down there this evening, um, uh, early, late, late this afternoon, uh, taking it in with many people from the public and enjoying it. And uh, we're very proud of this exhibition and congratulations to you again and, and thank you for everything. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I'm very grateful. And thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Great to see you, Archie. Uh, okay. Thank wonderful. You. And, and of course, thanks to the Farish Foundation here in Rochester for helping us to make all of this happen uh, during such challenging times. We're, 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 we're grateful for the support. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks for joining in. And we hope to see you again soon in real life without a mask. You can come now without a mask at the Memorial Art Gallery if you're vaccinated. So please do. We look forward to seeing your smiling faces. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.